Ah, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this festival of knowledge. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, the very first uh, speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Raymond Duraisen. He completed his graduation from Navros Vivaria College, Pune, and then post graduation and PhD from the Department of Geology, University of Pune in 1994 and 2008 respectively. He worked as a project assistant and uh, later on junior research fellow and then senior research fellow before joining Groundwater Surveys and Development Energy Government of Maharashtra as junior geologist. At GSDA, he was posted at R&D cell and worked on groundwater assessment issues of Maharashtra water scarcity and water quality related issues such as salinity, chloride, urban groundwater pollution, etc. Uh, later, he joined the Department of Geology Society by Pune, Pune University as an assistant professor. He was promoted as associate professor uh, later on. He presently heads the Department of Environmental Sciences at Society by Pune uh, University. Now, uh, his interests are ingenious petrology, physical volcanology, and hydrogeochemistry of groundwaters from the Deccan traps and associated uh, provinces. He has co edited around five books and has published 89 papers in national and international journals. His interests include physical work, volcanology, and hydrogeology of the Deccan traps, India, and study of Ophiolites from Himalayas and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Of late, he is concerned about geoenvironmental issues, geoheritage, climate change, and natural disasters. The volcano, volcanic geoheritage of the Deccan Traps and associated rock types are of special interest to him. In India, he has worked in diverse terrains such as higher Himalayas of Ladakh and Garaporam, uh, Sikkim. Manipur, Andaman Island, Thar Desert, and Salt Flats of Kutch. Uh, he has also visited countries like Malawi, Iran, France, Norway, Sweden, and Georgia in connection with geological methods. He is fellow and life member of professional organizations like Geology Society of India, Bangalore, Indian Science Congress Association of Calcutta, Gondwana Geological Society Nagpur, Vadia Institute of Himalayan Geology, Zairabun, uh, and yes. Indian Association of Geomatics, and uh, He has successfully guided four PhDs in environmental sciences and two PhDs in geology. At present, uh, eight PhDs taught to scholars are working about supervision yeah. on diverse geo-environmental topics and are registered under this guidance. Uh, welcome, Dr. Newman. Uh, he is going to talk uh, today on Earth's interior and rock cycle. Sir, you have got around 90 minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, out of that, 10 minutes will get for question and answer sessions. Uh, would you like to take questions uh, uh, when you are talking or uh, you will take it afterwards accordingly, but you have 90 minutes. Please let us know. So accordingly, participants can uh, unmute and ask questions. Please let us know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Hello. Good morning, sir. We can hear you, sir. Oh, good morning. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Kapil Bhatt, sir. Uh, thank you for that uh, elaborate introduction and uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir, it is visible. You can yes. put it in the slideshow mode. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I don't mind uh, questions in the middle, uh, provided it doesn't uh, engage too much of time. Uh, we'll, I, 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 I can, Keep it for the last, uh, but I think so spontaneity is most welcome. 
Good morning. Uh, what a wonderful day and what a wonderful theme to be talking about. Uh, I like your background. The backdrop shows planets and inner planets, outer planets, and that blue dot over there on your screen is our mother Earth. Earth, the only planet we have. And in the introduction, Professor Mahesh said that it's all about atoms. So I am a layman. I am basically a citizen interested in science. I am basically want to spread what I know. And as ma'am said in her introductory talk, I would love to gain insights into several aspects of who I am where I came from, and what am I busy with? Professor Mahesh Sethi also spoke, spoke about elements, elements that form during the Big Bang, elements that are forming even as we speak in, in massive stars, in dying stars, elements forming from cosmic ray fusion, and of course, low. Here we are, humans playing God, creating our own elements. No matter how small that achievement is, in terms of the cosmic drama that is unfolding right in front of us. A little bit of chemistry uh, would help, basically. The, the, the cosmos as we know it is made up of atoms. And the most abundant atoms are hydrogen and helium followed by oxygen. We past two years, we have been talking about oxygen uh, when we were facing with Corona. And oxygen is quite abundant compared to other elements in the universe. Coming closer, we can see elements that are abundant in our own solar system. Most of those elements are within us. We are atoms and unto atoms we shall go back to. And so we need to understand what have we discovered in deep space. Sir mentioned molecules, FeO, or FEMGO, ferropericlase. We have salts like KCL, NaCl, halite, and sylvite. We have silicon carbide, which is produced by humans in industrial processes. We have water, we have TiO2. What are we talking about? We're talking about molecules that are gases, molecules that are solid. And so we talk about solid earth, solid particles in space, matter. And most of this molecules that, that are enlisted over here are actually minerals for a geologist like me. So that forms the basis of what I know, like my city sir said, we detect them by spectroscopy. But for us geologists, they are solids. And if they are solids, it comes into our realm of work. We all know that there are hypotheses of how the solar system formed. And that beautiful theme, that visual theme on your, on your screen showed a segregation sort of, of inner planets versus the gigantic gas balls. Again, the inner planets surely are made up of solid, solid matter. Most of that solid matter 
are basically rocks. So we know that the inner planets are called as silicate planets. And again, that blue dot is us, our mother earth. Several of us have been told about exploration elsewhere on moon, on Mars. What about understanding our own planet? Knowing its story from 4.6 billion years to present. And that is the story about you, me, us, our planet. So if we look at the heat budget of the planet, planet Earth, then on the left you see a graph which is basically age versus heat product production over time gravitational collapse and radioactive decay are responsible for endogenous heat in any planetary system, especially the silicate planets. So what is Mother Earth being busy with? For 4.6 billion years, it's trying to shed all of that internal heat And as we see, most of the radio decay over time. So it is estimated that the Earth has lost not more than 500 degrees Celsius. And that's, that's unique to the Earth. So what has the Earth been busy? The Earth has been busy in reorganizing itself, creating gradients, pressure temperature gradients, and trying to lose all of that heat, internal heat, in the form of volcanism. So here's a table probably you know, which is called as the Goldsmith classification of the periodic table. And here elements are grouped according to their compatibility to earth processes. And I'm sure all of this is applicable to the moon, Mars, uh, Venus, Mercury, all of the satellites uh, of most uh, large uh, enough bodies uh, to, to differentiate. So this, this periodic table shows that elements prefer friends. Take for example the lithophile elements. Litho means rock and phile means loving. So lithophile elements such as lithium or tungsten these elements love to combine with silica, with silica. And therefore, they are incompatible in the interior of the earth or any planetary system. And so they are large ions, they have large diameters, they are incompatible to the pressure gradients within the earth's mantle and they tend to come out in the form of the lithosphere, which is part of mostly composed of the crust of the earth. The lithosphere is compatible with atmophile elements. So during volcanism, we are getting material that is being segregated from the mantle and helpful in creating the various spheres of the earth. Atmophile elements, for example. These are gaseous, they come out of volcanic emanations and then produce the atmosphere. We have the siderophile elements, gold, the platinoid group of elements, nickel, cobalt, manganese, iron, 
that segregate or differentiate to form core. And of course, there are sulfur loving material or elements that combine with lot of our copper, zinc, arsenic to form our economic deposits. So this geochemical classification is basically what the earth and other planetary systems are segregating in terms of their compatibility during magmatism, during volcanism. So that gives us a scenario where early earth was represented by the mantle. Today mantle may not be accessible directly for observation, for study. And that mantle segregates into the crust and into the core. So bulk primordial mantle, similar to chondrites and other meteoritic uh, bodies, differentiating into crust and core. That gives you the internal structure of the earth. So my dear friends, the earth has been busy segregating the crust and the core. And the critical ratio of the core to mantle, the timing of the segregation is very crucial for evolution of planetary bodies. The first proxy that we use to understand the interior of the earth is of course seismology. We have taught this right from, from our schooling days. How do you know the interior of the earth? Obviously by the travel times of P and S wave velocity during earthquakes. And that becomes the key to the interior of the earth. But wait a minute, did we say solid earth? Did we say solid geophysics? Well, if it is solid, it's, 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 it's rock. It's a material. It's, it's, it's minerals. So rocks and earth, uh, rocks and minerals within the interior of the earth control the propagation and attenuation of pre and S waves. So it means that the geophysical property of the earth, of the interior of the earth, is directly a reflection of the rock type and the mineralogy within the earth. And so a lot of people, a lot of geophysicists, a lot of physicists deal with the geophysical properties of the interior of the earth. Take for example, the geothermal gradient. Take for example, the profiles of pressure and temperature and density within the earth. This leads us to the fact that there is something tangible and solid there that we can measure in terms of solids. And that, of course, I have already emphasized is rocks and minerals. So what are the other proxies that we can use to study the interior of the earth, the mantle itself? Meteorites, as we rightly said. Kimberlites. These are the bullet trains, the messengers, the fast, highly um, subsonic types of volcanism coming from very deep down into the earth, coming from the crust, sorry, from the core mantle boundary and between 260 kilometers uh, deep into the mantle. These forms of volcanism have not been recorded on other planetary surfaces. They need to be discovered. They contain 
diamonds. So every time you see a natural diamond, remember it comes deep down from the mantle. Each and every one of them comes through this type of volcanism known as kimberlite lamproid magmatism. The volcanism that comes from deep down the earth also samples fragments of the mantle. Take for example, that small coin shaped yellow material that is from Kutch in India, Buj, Bujia Hill, that is from Bujia Hill. So that small yellow stuff that you see over there is part of the mantle about 60 kilometers deep that has been sampled by volcanism. So these are known as xenoliths and they are the direct probes that are available to study mantle. And the three photographs that you see are basically of spinels and olivines, mag manganese, iron, silicate in the mantle. So we have access to the mantle through its proxies. Take for example, the upper part of the mantle that is exposed in the Himalayas. When India collided with, with Tibet, if you go to Ladakh, for example, if you go to Somorari, uh, if, you go to, if you go to Orange Hills in Dras, then that orange colored rock or green colored rock that you see is basically the upper part of the mantle that is abducted onto, onto the edge of the continent because of tectonism. So ophiolites also constitute a large chunk of, of mantle rocks that are slammed onto continents because of plate tectonics and they can be used to study. For example, the photograph that I'm showing you on the right, that very, very colorful, uh, artistic, abstract sort of painting that you can see over here is basically the slide of mantle rock. And if you see uh, the intergrowth over there in the slide, uh, if you can see my pointer in the center, it looks like, uh, like a ball uh, being eaten up by this black stuff. Then that is basically known as the petrological moho. There is an equation, garnet plus olivine is equal to spinel plus clinopyroxy. So that is what is happening out there in the center of that beautiful colored picture. That means garnet, which is stable at around 60 kilometers depth and deeper, simply converts to spinel. So there is an inversion that is happening. And that constitutes nothing but the moho, mohovic discontinuity, separating the upper mantle from the crust. So for every geophysical discontinuity that you see from seismic refraction or from the seismic profile, there is a mineralogical phase transition that is the direct evidence for that geophysical signature. So that is what I wanted to bring to you. In, in short, uh, as I speak, you can of course see the composition of the Earth's mantle. It's very rich in magnesium silicate and iron silicate. And that is responsible for the 3.9 to 3 uh, grams per centimeter cube density of, of these rocks. And therefore the mantle, the, the, the mantle uh, is basically very dense, very heavy, very compact. It is deforming as you can see in the picture. Uh, you can see uh, there is deformation in the minerals. There is fracturing. There is no space uh, out there in the mantle. And the high pressure gradient forces minerals to be very, very compact. 
Compare that with the crust. The crust has a density, average density of around 2.6 to 2.9, depending on whether it is basaltic or whether it is granitic. So the mantle, my friends, is composed of these rocks, and I don't want to bore you with, with, with these rocks. And these rocks are also present on the crust because of tectonism. So now we know that all those discontinuities or all those bumps on this, on this graph are nothing but mineralogical phase transitions in the interior of the earth. And so if you, if you draw a mineralogical interior of the earth, then this is what you see, that the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary is basically marked by the Mohorovich discontinuity, which is basically garnet to spinel transition. And if you go deeper than the, than the magnesium, silicate known as olivine converts or inverts at 410 kilometers into vatsilite and then at 500 to ringwoodite. The composition is the same, but the phase transition includes changing the, the style of, of the internal structure or the arrangement of the mineral. So olivine is orthorhombic and ringwoodite, uh, and this thing can be tetragonal or they can be also cubic. So basically what you can see over here is that the forcing by pressure changes the internal arrangement of atoms, giving rise to a different XRD pattern and therefore a new mineral. So atoms and molecules the arrangement in the silicate structure changes with pressure temperature drift, giving rise to different petrophysical properties or geophysical properties, leading to a differentiation in the geophysical signature of the rocks. Ultimately, if you see lower mantle, that is the boundary where no more silicates are present. In fact, only the oxides are present. So a lot of physics people are looking for perovskite or synthesizing perovskite for various applications in, in physics. We geologists know that perovskites come from very deep. Uh, they are naturally synthesized by the earth and they come out in the form of volcanism, the kimberlite sort of volcanism. So if you use the mineralogical interior of the earth, then you can see these phase boundaries. Diamond to graphite, very, very shallow. For us geologists, that is very, very shallow. That is seven uh, gigapascals, around seven gigapascals. Very, very shallow. And garnet to spinel on the top, that is the Mohs discontinuity. That is the boundary between crust and mantle. And other discontinuities are basically changes in the internal structure of magnesium silicates, leading finally at around 720 or 740 kilometers depth to the breakup of the silicates and conversion into oxides. And therefore, we find that the oxygen that we breathe comes from these great depths. Nothing is coming from space. Everything that we have on the earth is from the belly of the earth. So you can see that silicates are stable to around 700 kilometers. And then from there on, the advanced titaniferous silicates come into play and of course the oxides, peripericlase and periclase, manganese oxide. 
This is therefore the internal structure of the earth. And here is a comparison. I'm giving you the references. You can check this up for paucity of time. You cannot dwell more on this topic. So here you can see how the low velocity zone, how the discontinuities are basically nothing but the proportioning of minerals in those zones. Do we have a question? I, I, I would like to take a question if you have one. Okay. So we move on to the next phase of our talk. What makes the earth unique? Why is the earth active? It's geologically live. Well, it's sister planets, Mars and Venus. We are so eager to explore them. Why are they geologically dead? We, we are thinking of colonizing them. So we need to know them better. No doubt. But what about understanding Mother Earth? Is it that we have, why is it that we have lost only 500 degrees Celsius? over time. That means a lot of energy is still in the belly of the earth. Obviously, we know that besides radiation, volcanism is the key. It holds the key to the cooling process of, of a planetary body. And so something is there unique in the style of volcanism on earth that is sustaining or slowly releasing its endogenous heat. And we know that we have different styles of volcanism on earth. Shield volcanoes such as at Hawaii and Iceland, uh, these are uh, around 500 meters uh, above mean sea level. I mean, the edifice itself can be around 500 meters. And they are fountaining. Uh, they, are, they are very gentle giants. They are, they are fountaining. Uh, does not reach more than 500 meters in the air. So they are, they are very quiescent. They are non-violent type of volcanisms, the shield volcanoes. If you can identify the photo in the lower um, part of the slide, it's very clear that it is very clear that this is Mount Etna. And these are known as stratovolcano. Mount Etna rises about 330 uh, meters above sea level. So definitely there is some clue in the difference or the combination of types of volcanism that controlled the internal energy of the earth. If we look at geo geophysical profiles across various tectonic zones on the earth, it is very clear that the styles of volcanisms are different. Take for example, the first one mid-oceanic ridge, the B figure. It is only when the geothermal gradient intersects the solidus of the rock that we get melting. So melting does not occur continuously below the earth. Many laymen think that if you drill too deep, then there will be liquid molten magma there. No, that's not the case. That's because the geotherm does not intersect the solidus of the rock and therefore there is no uniform melting in the interior of the earth. They are solid rocks. 
So only in certain tectonic cases, such as the mid-oceanic ridges, on the ocean floor, we get melting. And that melting is very, very shallow, less than 50 kilometers. So we have depth of melting and style of melting. That's known as the mid-oceanic ridge type of volcanism. And of course, then we have, or like we already discussed, the hotspot type of volcanism. These are messengers from the deep, like the Kimberlites, or in the island of Reunion, uh, we find that there is continuous volcanism stationary for millions of years, or Hawaii, for example. These volcanisms are slow. They come from very deep. You can see the temperature difference, 1200 degrees at mid-oceanic ridge and 1600 degrees at hotspot volcanism. So there is, there is a different energy budget to this. And of course, the last type that is known as island arc. So you can see that melting in hotspots, decompressional melting occurs at greater than 100 kilometers. And because we know a third type of volcanism on Earth that is known as the island arc. Here, basically, the oceanic crust along with water goes, sinks below the continent and melting reoccurs at a lower temperature. So here, melting will occur at 500 degrees 700 degrees because of the presence of water, which lowers the solidus. And therefore you have a third type of volcanism known as island arc type of volcanism. We do not know the style of volcanisms on other planetary surface. We know this on earth. And everything else is speculative in planetology because we, we, we don't have a lot of seismometers installed. We don't know their interiors. We don't know their heat budgets. A lot of things need to be done in terms of, but we are doing what we have, the earth. Take for example- Sir, the a question. Yes, sir. Uh, physically, how deep uh, one has drilled, whether on landmass or so, ocean floor? So the so the deepest uh, excavation in terms of a mine is basically the Kolar Goldfield Mine, which is two kilometers. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people are doing particle physics experiments at two kilometers, right? Neutron uh, uh, type of experiments. Uh, that that will be on that will be on the landmass, which means the yeah, crust two is kilometers. thicker. Crust yeah. is even thicker. Two so, kilometers and. And the deepest uh, bore is basically at, at Kola Peninsula. The Russians have drilled 12 kilometers. That is the deepest. Remaining on the ocean floor, if you're asking me, then uh, they are about two to three kilometers. Most of the oil fields uh, drilling goes on to two to three kilometers for oil. And uh, some of the deeper IODP uh, boreholes, they will go to three to four kilometers. So th there is a challenge uh, to drill. Uh, uh, our own uh, uh, program, uh, Deep Sea, uh, sorry, uh, is at Koina. Uh, okay, so we have uh, drilled one and a half kilometers in Koina, 1.8. Okay, uh, and in the coming years, it is envisaged that we will have a deep uh, bore at 10 kilometers to understand uh, the Indian lithosphere. So uh, it, it, it would mean that uh, nobody has reached asthenosphere yet? Not at all, sir. Okay. It's, it's very difficult because you see, uh, there is friction, uh, there is an increase of geothermal gradient. We, we if you, if I, I miss that point, uh, I will take you back to that slide. Yeah. So the thumb rule is 500 degrees increase every 40 kilometers. So, so as you drill, uh, you are actually uh, going down the geothermal gradient. So everything starts heating up. Uh, you have to drill uh, with fluids, uh, cooling down the system. 
it's it's very difficult the russians have achieved 12 kilometers i don't think uh, we can do any better and that uh, that program is suspended thank you sir yes so if you look at other planetary bodies like mars uh, we know that mars had a unique system of volcanism olympus mons about 21 22 kilometers high single volcanic system everything from the core of mars degassed through these dozens of volcanoes through these dozens of volcanoes of course we have such type of volcanism coming from very deep like in the southern hemisphere we have an isotopic anomaly known as the dupal anomaly excessive lead in the southern hemisphere we can know whether the sample comes from from the southern oceans from atlantic pacific indian oceans because they contain excessive lead if you look at the total budget planetary budget if you take the amount of uranium thorium and you do the calculations the ultimate product should be lead but on earth you find anomalous amounts of lead that does not add up using the decay constants that we know it means something else has happened to the planet some mass has been lost or we have gained something in terms of high mu and this is only in the southern hemisphere so samples from antarctica uh, from australia from indian ocean uh, they are exogenous lead is absolutely there this is not in the northern hemisphere so we know there is some perturbation that is deep perturbation in the earth for the something is missing this is known as the lead paradox something is missing uh, to know why there is excessive lead in the southern hemispheres and i don't know the answer none of us know it prayatnashil uh, hai right this is work in progress so we know that planetary systems mars lost all of its heat through deep mantle plumes creating enormous gigantic in fact mons olympus is the largest volcano in the known universe in the known universe silicate huh? silicate planet uh, let me put that disclaimer disclaimer 21 kilometers again done by the modo that is uh, by laser in interferometry so we know that definitely it, it, it's around 20 kilometers and more so it must have lost a lot of heat and lo mars has some few feeble mars quakes we know that that mars is still it's on the way of 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 dying off so a lot of degassing so mars must have had a proto atmosphere just like the earth but its atmosphere is lost again the question comes why and we'll try to understand this so i have animations for earth uh, i know biplov is here he must have seen this before uh so So this is a small animation showing you what type of volcanism is at mid oceanic ridge they are very shallow around 40 kilometers 30 kilometers and they produce the saima the oceanic crust which is basaltic uh, this volcanism creates new oceanic crust and the new oceanic crust is then split into two parts 
and forms a conveyor belt sort of situation. So younger lava is erupted closer to the fracture, the mid-oceanic ridge, and is pushed away from the mid-oceanic ridge, leading to a convective cell. And since the circumference of the Earth in the past 300 uh, million years is nearly constant, what comes up needs to go. So this is, uh, this is what happens. So the mid-oceanic ridge, we lose uh, heat uh, because the volcanism is around 1200 degrees Celsius under the wa water. It creates new land masses, Iceland, for example, uh, that is the tip of, of the mid-oceanic ridge above the surface of the, uh, of the water. And therefore, we, we know that this is the driving mechanism for rifting of continents and formation of oceans. But you just cannot go on forming oceans. There is a limit to it because the circumference of the earth is constant and therefore what comes up goes down. So when a continent comes, when an oceanic crust comes to the edge of the continent, the rate of spreading, the rate of spreading is responsible for what happens to the continental crust. So if you can see me, if the rate of spreading is slow and there is a continent, this is what happens. If the rate of spreading comes, then this is what happens. The continent simply sinks. But if the rate of spreading is fast, then this is what happens. The oceanic floor obducts onto the continent. So from six kilometers below sea level to six kilometers above sea level, that is the story of oceanic crust in Ladakh. Gigantic forces slamming, India slamming the ocean, Tethys Ocean slammed onto the Himalayas. It's a must to visit Ladakh and see these beautiful exposures. At the same time, what happens is if it is slow spreading, then the crust goes back. And as I said, along with water, the, 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 the melting occurs at a shallow depth. And therefore, you find a second type of volcanism on Earth, which is known as island arc volcanism. So the mighty Himalayas, the mighty Rockies, the mighty Andes, and a lot of the granites in these mountains, including the Alps, are formed when plates subducted below continents produce magmatism in the form of these mountain chains. So this process is known as orogenesis, right? So this is the unique style of the earth. And so what has happened is on earth, the volcanism, the predominant volcanism is shallow. That means up to 40 kilometers or in the subduction zone, you know the marina trench is 10 kilometers depth. The trench itself is 10 kilometers depth, but the continent slides down further up to 250 kilometers. That in geophysics is known as the Benioff zone, okay, in, in seismic uh, profiles or in magnetotellurics, you can see low velocity zones because of melt, fluid and water. So subduction zones are the second type of volcanism predominating on the earth. So we have two types of volcanism, the mid oceanic ridge volcanism depicted in this map as white lines. And we have subduction zones shown as the magenta lines with the direction sense of the triangle of the plate motion. And along these trenches, we know that a lot of material goes down into the earth, melts along with seawater. So sodium chloride is added to it. That fluxing is responsible for most of the copper, silver, gold, mineralization 
in these mountainous chains. We have to discover ours in India. We haven't discovered any huge deposit in the Himalayas. Molybdenum, copper, zinc, tungsten, tin. These are the minerals that get that get concentrated in this type of volcanism. So the earth has two type of volcanisms and these volcanisms go down up to 250 kilometers and that constitutes the, the asthenosphere. And so we, the earth is actually losing heat only from the asthenosphere, not from deeper. That is insulated now. And therefore, the Earth continues to be a vibrant, dynamic planet, unlike the deep mantle plume type of, of volcanism, like in Mons Olympus. The entire heat is lost. The entire oxygen, atmosphere, hydrosphere that should have been preserved on the Earth, on like on the Earth, is lost to deep space. So this is known as the Wilson cycle, the birth of ocean and destruction of ocean. And this process leads to the formation of asthenosphere with a lot of fluids changing the geophysical character of the, of the upper mantle compared to the lower mantle. So the lower mantle is still refractory, still contains all of the heat. The earth is going to live forever sort of scenario because the asthenosphere provides the buffer to heat loss on our planetary surfaces. Sir, there are there is the question. Sir, please, please, sir. Yeah, there are two questions. I have one question. Uh, uh, you are saying that asthenosphere is basically uh, working as a heat shield. Yes. So the lower heat is not coming out. So which yes. particular chemical composition or structure uh, can be held responsible for this, which probably yes. is missing on Mars? Uh, that is one question. We 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 do not. Know. Of course, uh, we know what is the structure uh, of the mantle in Mars. It's going to be convex, just like in Earth. Okay, so it will be the bulk undifferentiated silicate, and this this rock is basically consisting of uh, of uh, about uh, seventy to eighty percent olivine. So the melting temperature of olivine is you know sixteen hundred degrees. So, so there is no melt generated there, right? Uh, so the minerals that could melt are basically garnet, spinel, and clinopyroxene. They are again uh, magnesium, aluminum, silicates, right? Uh, so we, we definitely know uh, that most of the mantle is olivine uh, and olivine is refractory. Uh, we know that uh, several meteorites contain a lot of olivine. Okay. Uh, in fact, ringwoodite, uh, a mineral that is uh, a polymorph of olivine, uh, is basically uh, reported uh, on Earth from, from meteorites, from chondrites. Right? So we have only one place uh, where we have ringwoodite in a kimberlite, uh, Earth ringwoodite. But most of the ringwoodites defined and studied are from, from from uh, from uh, say from from meteorites, even shergotites for that matter, they contain ringwoodite. You know, shergotites are from uh, uh, a special type of uh, of uh, of meteorites. So we definitely know where uh, and what is there on planetary surfaces. Okay. I, I hope I tried to answer your question, sir. Yeah. We can of uh, course connect uh, further uh, and uh, yeah. I'm just, uh, you know, just adding uh, or I mean asking uh, this that on Mars, when we say a lot of heat is given out and it is almost becoming dead. Uh, yes, sir. Is it because so? I mean, if you claim, is, is it because being lesser weight? Uh, yes, could sir. not attract more meteorites and have those uh, compositions. We are coming to that, sir. Okay. We will there spend one... one lecture. Uh, we can spend. Uh, Okay. One slide on that, yeah. Okay, I will there answer is, your question. Yeah, there is there is a question in the chat. Sorry, sir. Uh, I for, first, there the is class. a request.
that can we have the Wilson cycle slide again on the screen? And yeah. uh, there is a question that uh, it is about Ram Setu rocks are said to be floating on water. So, I mean, what are they made up of? Mm, that is a tricky question, sir. Uh, they are not made up of any uh, volcanic rocks. That's what the science says. Uh, fate is a different uh, ball game altogether. Uh, there is no uh, volcanism in the Park Strait. Uh, as told that they are pumice, uh, that's not true. They could be rafted pumice, say, from, from Indonesia. Oh, we can never be sure uh, in terms of their... It's never been found, uh, never been worked on. Uh, no isotopic characterization. So we leave it at that, I mean. <laughs> so uh, so yeah. one thing is, uh, there's nothing like floating. Sorry? But there is nothing like floating there. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is one thing. And second thing, I mean, just to answer his question, because he said floating on water. So yeah, nothing yeah. like floating. Yeah, yeah, nothing uh, floating. But it, is, uh, it seems to be a very natural uh, construction. Uh, they should that? be they sh, they sh, they that no basically it's a sand spit on 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 a basement high okay, okay. so the so the rocks that are in uh, kanyakumari leading into uh, so th that is the green valian terrain uh, as a residue uh, from from the from the split up of antarctica and this thing right so it can just be a basement high Okay. Right, and now sand is accumulating over there because of currents, uh, because of uh, the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea currents. So that that is the geomorphic setup of that area. Okay, thank you, sir. Right. Yeah. So the Wilson cycle, catch it up. Uh, I've given you the reference, uh, Wilson College to Wilson cycle. Uh, that's 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 going to be very unique uh, in this talk. Right. So what are the evidences? The evidences are here that rifting of the continents occur. This is the San Andreas Fault. Uh, of course, we see the mid-oceanic ridge breaking or splitting Iceland into two. Uh, and uh, that's the evidence for you, modern-day evidence. And then from Africa, we can see the East African rift system. Uh, you can see that the rift has developed. Uh, most of our freshwater lakes are there. The origin of Nile is related to this uh, East African rift system. And not long ago, uh, I, I did not find uh, last week's image, uh, but uh, this is what is happening to Africa. This is what is happening to Africa. So it's very, very contemporary. Uh, I seen an image uh, about four days back. I could not trace it back on the internet uh, of opening of Africa once again like this, right? So it's very much happening uh, during our times. You can see uh, how the road has been cracked open by these gigantic rifts on the continents. So let us just enjoy this beautiful thing. We know that oceans open, the Wilson cycle is true, uh, continental drift occurs, uh, there is birth of Atlantic oceans, India migrates from Southern hemisphere, and culminates, slams the ocean into Tibet. So we know that the volcanism on Earth is responsible for plate tectonics. That's the driving flows. Uh, we know plates move, and uh, we know that mountain building processes, orogenesis, the oceans are evolving, the land is evolving through volcanism, the atmosphere is evolving. In fact, I always tell my students, we belong to the best of times. At 540 million years, we had 14 hours. Now we have 24 hours. During Precambrian times, we had no oxygen. Today we have 20% of oxygen. I know one of the gentlemen uh, was very interested in understanding evolution at the atmosphere and one of the experts is going to talk about it. So the earth has undergone 
two geochemical differentiations. I will try to finish my talk uh, within the stipulated time and have more interactions. So the earth has gone into two geochemical differentiations uh, to form the internal structure of the earth. The first geochemical differentiation is uh, separation. Me, sir. Uh, Sorry. Uh, before you uh, go ahead, sir, sir. there is a question that what are the factors behind East African drift? Where does this piece of land mix connect? Is there any possibility that it will drift toward India? Wait for the last, sir. Uh, I have all of that uh, in, okay, in my sir. presentation. Thank right? you. So please hold your horses. Uh, I will try to answer all of that. So the first geochemical differentiation is separation of the crust from the mantle. That is very critical. And that is driven by volcanism. So on Mars, on Venus, they must have had the same history because they are sister planets. So the first geochemical differentiation on these planetary bodies, including the moon, our own moon, we know there is a mantle. We do not know what is uh, the core or what is the kind of core or is there a core. And we know that the crust is very thin in case of, of, of the moon that is made up of basalts. And, uh, and the mantle is made up of ant, anorthosite, norite, troctite. We know this very well. So, so what happens to the Earth is exactly what happens to the other planetary bodies, including Mars and Venus. The first geochemical differentiation creates the crust. And of course, you can see that the crust, silica, alumina, and oxygen are predominant. Obviously, oxygen is incompatible in the mantle. And therefore, oxygen, like the atmo other atmospheric elements, is expelled through volcanism. Okay, and that produces the atmosphere, that produces the lithosphere. So, so the upper parts of the earth, including the rock up to 40 kilometers are very much oxygenated. Uh, most of them are silicates, uh, but of course you have free oxygen and uh, free nitrogen, for example. Right, so this is the abundances, this is present on Wikimapia, you can, uh, Wikipedia, you can see it, how the lithosphere is marked in the green, uh, and how the core is marked in yellow, right? And then the mantle uh, has everything in middle. So the first geochemical separation is separation of these elements marked by green. And of course, the second geochemical differentiation is separation of the core from the mantle. Okay, because it is going against the, against the geo, uh, geothermal gradient, against the pressure gradient. So it's easier for the crust to separate out first than the core. And, and, and that is how planets evolve. So we have to understand this in terms of the first geochemical differentiation and the second geochemical differentiation of the earth, which led to, which led to the crust. And of course, I'm not going to talk about the Seal and the Sima. We know that the ocean crust is basaltic while the continental crust are are, are granitic. And over the years, we have found that certain regions in the Earth, Greenland, Antarctica, there the crust is extremely thick, 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers. And even thicker crust is found in the Rockies, Andes, and in the Himalayas. Some of the Himalayan routes are greater than 120 kilometers deep. So extreme thickening of the crust. This is an earth process. Uh, probably we do not know if such thing has occurred on moons and Mars. So a lot of happy missions uh, in future, but let us understand Mother Earth, right? Uh, and of course, we have seen uh, that we use minerals that are timekeepers, such as zircon. And I know Deepak is going to speak about this uh, uh, dating of rocks. So he will continue with that, uh, that aspect. And so from the dating of the, because, because zircons, uh, unlike diamonds, uh, they are the timekeepers of the universe. Uh, we can use, because they encapsulate as they grow the uranium. And the uranium is in a closed capsule and disintegration is spontaneous uh, with expulsion of alpha particle and beta particles. They get converted into the uranium, thorium, plutonium series. Uh, and of course, uh, we have clocks and therefore we can measure the age 
of, of rocks. So we know that the continents have grown in leaps and bounds. There is no uniformity to it, right? It means that volcanism has been, uh, been uh, building continental crust in, in, in not in a continuous uh, fashion, not in a linear fashion, uh, not in, a, in an exponential fashion, but in leaps and bounds, like what you see in the graph uh, depicted by Condi and Astor in 2010. So the continents grew in leaps and bounds. There are times when oceans dominated and when continents dominated. Okay, and most of the old oceanic crust, for example, in, in, in India, the peninsular India is the oldest crust probably even in the world. We have not dated our rocks enough to claim that we have the oldest rocks in the world, but definitely they are very, very old. Uh, for example, if you go to uh, if you go to uh, Chamundi, uh, Chamundi Hills in Mysore, that granite is about 1.8 million years old. If you go to if you go to Maddikeri, for example, that is about 3.2 billion years. So, so extremely old rocks are found in our continent, in, including some of the parts of Singhu. Right? So India itself is an amalgamation of this old continental crust. Coming to the second geochemical differentiation, and I'm not an expert on this, but I would set the cats among the pigeons uh, in, in, in terms of discussion here, is the suppression of the core. And the mantle to core ratio is very critical in planetary surfaces because it sets the dynamo and we create a magnetosphere. In case of the Earth, the formation of the magnetosphere or the time of formation of the magnetosphere is so critical that it is responsible for preserving the atmosphere, hydrosphere and biosphere on Earth. So the critical ratio of core to mantle, if you have a very small core, you will have a very feeble magnetic magnetosphere. And that's not going to preserve uh, the atmosphere and oxygen and uh, of course carbon dioxide. And therefore most of the planets, because they either have the, uh, the mantle core ratio uh, not critical enough to create a strong magnetic field around the Earth. Uh, and uh, we are lucky that uh, the Earth did this in time. So the timing of formation of uh, the, uh, the magnetosphere is, is dated at around 2.6 billion years. And by that time, we have lithosphere, we have atmosphere, and we have oceans. And simply, the formation of the magnetosphere at that critical time was responsible for the preservation of these spheres. That did not happen on other planetary surfaces, that timing. And therefore, uh, the cosmic rays and of course, um, all of uh, the, the solar winds uh, simply scavenged off uh, these, these shells uh, on other planetary surfaces. So the core mantle um, boundary, the core mantle dynamics, and the preservation of this beautiful uh, magnetosphere that we have around the Earth is so important for, uh, for life on Earth, for example, or for preservation of the atmosphere. If you look at the atmospheres of, of, of three planets, our sisters over here, you can see Venus has 98% carbon dioxide. Uh, Mars has 96% uh, carbon dioxide. It was no different for Earth, definitely. But today, something has happened. Look at oxygen. We have 21% of oxygen. Mars has 2.5% of oxygen. Weak magnetosphere? Definitely the answer. Right? And so you have this over the 4.6 billion years, atmospheric evolution. 
methane ammonia water carbon dioxide primitive earth 2.6 let me give you a context of 2.6 if you go to chitradurg on the way to uh, to 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 bangalore then you have a granite which is known as the close bed granite uh, let me go back to yeah if you see this india map then in the center lies this belt of red uh, red granite okay in southern india that is 2.6 billion years so when that was forming in the belly of the earth the magnetosphere clicked in so those granites hold something very very precious they were witness to the formation to the segregation of the core and ticking of the magnetosphere and therefore i would i would love to speak about this uh, evolution there's paucity of time you see that carbon dioxide and methane is phased out is sequestered and then at about 2.6 billion years you get increase in oxygen to the present levels so the magnetosphere is responsible for preservation of the hydrosphere i am not going to talk about this because that was not the topic uh, preservation of the atmosphere and hydrosphere and therefore the evolution of the biosphere so early uh, times the conditions were not good so we had blue green algae at around 2.6 billion years the oxygen level was low the carbon dioxide was high photosynthesis was created and the blue green algae for example the stromatolites this is uh, we are just destroying all of our stromatolites all the limestones in south india which contain this early formed stromatolitic life we are always given examples ki australia mein stromatolites hai nahi nahi india mein there are seven purana basins and all basins contain stromatolites and all of these are being destroyed for cement so what the earth sequestered in yester years the carbon dioxide that was sequestered is now being released by man in the form of cement in the form of high rise that is required the concrete is required so cement so so earlier sequestered carbon dioxide is being released and fortunately we have the blue green algae and later on the plants that recycle the oxygen into the atmosphere so we should be grateful for that in fact it is said that that almost 60% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from diatoms uh, um, blue green algae uh, that and by by cretaceous time the diatoms have diversified so much that they are recycling the oxygen in and of course the magnetosphere is preserving so you can see how the magnetosphere kicking in is responsible for the evolution of life and subsequent diversification so i won't talk on this just enjoy the slides the movement of animals from the ocean to land and then the increase of oxygen uh, on land evolution finally i would like to take you to this part this is anthropocene our age and this is what we are doing to mother earth all this story has been told in yester years by james hutton james hutton was ridiculed uh, by the royal society of of london for example for his theory of earth and of course the rock cycle we know that on the larger scale the plate tectonics that is the eruption at the marm and the uplift of continents the formation of the continents the denudation of the continents is responsible for the rock cycle on earth so igneous material comes onto the earth cools solidifies it is weathered by the agents of weathering in the hydrological system in the atmospheric system the sediments are carried to the ocean redeposited as sedimentary rocks sedimentary rocks are transformed into metamorphic rocks and pre-existing sediments and metamorphic rocks are further melted 
and the cycle goes on. This cycle is immortal on earth. It will go on so long as the earth is dynamic. And we know that it's going to be dynamic for a long, long time. So these are images that I wanted to speak about, but I will take you to the future uh, with this animation and then we can have questions. So this process is now, we know this configuration now and please enjoy the video. This is Australia. That is what happens to the East African Rift system. Australia will merge with Asia. Africa will merge with Eurasia. Arctic circle will open up. Antarctica will move from its southern pole. The Atlantic Ocean will open. That will lead to the death of the Pacific Ocean. Antarctica will slam back. and we will start having a supercontinent once again. And a super ocean. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, the talk is now open for questions. I, I hope the last question, which was around uh, that uh, East African rift, East African rift, etc., is been answered. So, uh, if there are any questions, let us know. We can. Uh, Sir, uh... There is a, a question. Please. You mentioned the uh, oxygen uh, or the brighter elements become incompatible in mantle. So yes. Is it uh, because of their low mass density or in Yes. Else? So uh, you see, uh, it's not only about uh, density. It's also about uh, charge. Uh, let me go to the... Uh, uh, let me go to, say, the periodic table. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, low density, you can say definitely lithium, beryllium, boron, aluminum, silica, right? Uh, even potassium for that matter. These are basically lighter elements. So obviously they would, uh, uh, they would be incompatible in uh, the high pressure regime, okay? But other elements uh, such as potassium, calcium, strontium, barium, and also the lanthanides, Okay, these are extremely large, large. Okay, so these are known as large iron lithophile elements. So, so they have large configuration, electronic configurations. And as I told you, uh, there is no space in, 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 in the mantle because the pressures are very high. So obviously uh, the bulky guys uh, will always be thrown out of the room. Okay, so that you can accommodate more, uh, more lean guys. Okay, that sort of scenario is in the mantle, right? It is also the electronegativity, fluorine, for example, right? Uh, so, so the charge and the ionic size, uh, that determines. And of course, their geochemical affinity. Their geochemical affinity is, uh, is to, to, to basically combine with oxygen. And oxygen itself is incompatible. So, so they would go with silica and oxygen. Uh, and since you know that going down, uh, the silica and oxygen goes down in the lower mantle, 
they are friends with oxygen and silica. So therefore, they try to come up, right, in, in, in magmatism. So, so you can see uh, that the outer uh, layers of the earth are silicates. Uh, the lower mantle is basically lesser of silicate, more of uh, oxides, and then the core is of native uh, metals. Right, so at the core, uh, the the material, uh, the the bonding uh, cannot happen. Right at those pressures, uh, and therefore, uh, therefore they are in metallic form. Right, so they are metals in the core. Uh, they are oxides in the lower mantle, and of course they are silicates uh, in the in the lithosphere, for example. Thank uh, you. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's. I mean, I'm just not going into the science. Uh, just telling you. Yes, uh, it, sir. Yes. Uh, Professor Anuvalya would like to ask something. Sir, please. Um, hello, uh, Professor Raymond. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. I enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, pictures were just wonderful. I. Try to capture those pictures also as I was listening to your. Sir, talk. I can share the presentation, sir. It is not okay. mine at all. Okay. It's just a compilation of uh, thank stuff you. Thank from you everywhere. Much. Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy to uh, actually, share it. Then. Actually, I come from Shimla. That yes, is, sir. I am in Himalayas. Yes, sir. And only yesterday, you know, I was traveling in uh, Kulu region, you know. Yes, sir. Where a lot of uh, uh, activity is going on, not because of the Mother Earth, but because yes, of the human beings. Yes, sir. And it's, it was very scary to see that how mountains are, you know, crumbling down. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, do you think that these kinds of activities on the earth uh, will also affect uh, the geological activities which are taking place right now? Uh, maybe they will trigger something very, very violent, yes, sir. which we may not be expecting. I mean, that was coming to my mind when I I, 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 won't, to... I won't sound political. I'll try not to be. But yes, uh, see, even the elements are obeying the laws of thermodynamics, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, we have seen how the earth itself, uh, the elements are, are uh, uh, compatible with the pressure temperature gradient. Now in the Himalayas, uh, everything that has been the Tethys Ocean is basically compressed into say two uh, into say 50 kilometers. So the entire Tethys Ocean, Paleo Tethys Ocean, is compressed uh, within. So the rocks are thrusted, they are folded, uh, the roots are going down uh, to 120 kilometers. So what happens is basically uh, what goes down comes up. And therefore, the Himalayas are rising. They are rising at the plate continues to basically uh, slam into, into Tibet even now because the angular momentum uh, from Cretaceous time uh, has to be maintained. And therefore, towards Nanga Parbat, that is towards Gilgit, uh, the plate is moving at a, a rate of 27 uh, centimeters per year. While in the Namcha Barwar area, towards the uh, towards uh, uh, towards uh, uh, Burma, the plate is like 17 degrees, uh, 17 centimeters. Per. So India itself is under a differential, and uh, India is subducting under 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 Tibet even now. Okay, so all these earthquakes that you find are basically manifestation of India. The stress is being built because of this differential movement of India towards Tibet. Right, so all the Himalayan regions are basically abducted, and it's a law of nature, uh, basically, that the landmass is rising, and the rivers are cutting them down. Right, so mm -hmm. this is uh, the so the so this is what exactly is happening. So naturally, uh, the for example, Mount Everest, uh, when uh, Hillary and uh, Tenzing Norgay climbed was lower than what today's mountainous climb. Mm -hmm. Do you yes. get the point? So the Himalayas are yeah, rising. I, I, I got the point. Yeah, and the uh, rivers are cutting it down. Now, mm -hmm. if you add to that your developmental mm -hmm. ethos, yes, then uh, you, are, uh, you are heading for disaster. It's that simple. 
so we will have to be very very careful in what we are doing uh, now okay we may hand over to our future generation uh, himalayas that is not worth inhabiting oh that's a very strong statement which you are making sir that's why i said uh, that may sound very political but yes what do we hand over to the next generation is is what we are doing today mm, uh, there was another question sir may i ask you please sir please uh, uh, you know your um, talk really was uh, truly multidisciplinary we were hearing all those terminologies which you were using in physics in some some context isn't it yes sir now as uh, uh, a member of the iapt you know people keep on asking us that uh, how can can multidisciplinarity be part of the uh, physics curriculum and what are the opportunities which can really bring to the physics students if they start you know studying these kinds of uh, courses absolutely would you sir. like to give us some kind of uh, uh, your uh, uh, look into that crystal ball that if we go in that direction with physics in hand App and maybe geology in hand then what what kind of possibilities and opportunities are there absolutely sir uh, that is why i have been asked uh, the pune university vice chancellor suresh gosavi is basically uh, from physics background uh, and uh, he has uh, asked me to join as head environment department because it's a multidisciplinary uh, aspect um, a lot of earth materials are basically in material sciences or uh, in 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 physics phase transformations xrd see every uh, for example every entity for us uh, basically uh, the physics and chemistry is the backbone of geology and actually even geology is not being taught Uh, from that perspective of having so we have to marry the physics chemistry and uh, the earth material right uh, from ceramics uh, to astrophysics uh, basically uh, if we have this geological touch to these subjects right uh, i think so it will be wonderful uh, hand holding across our subjects and therefore uh, we have started uh, in pune university science and technology Uh, as a faculty uh, where technology can evolve from the sciences and for example geothermal energy uh, which mm. is an emerging field right it requires so much of uh, of geophysics it re requires so much of uh, of uh, even climate change where, which i am trying to introduce here is basically stefan boltzmann constants and mm -hmm. all gas laws all of these sir are, are so important uh, unfortunately uh, that was not the part of syllabus and curriculum the new education policy now yeah. enables us to hold hand and so many of our students are opting for uh, courses in physics and many students from physics uh, are taking xrd and other other subjects so this process is uh, ongoing and i think so i will be very interested because it Uh, the the learning is always two way sir i mean yes sir yes yeah, sir yeah and therefore so i fact, would be very uh, sir, yes sir we would like to give you some trouble uh, no, no, for no, enlightening us on these counts yes sir uh, because iapt's agenda is that only yes sir and i really really enjoyed your lecture it was just wonderful the the speed with which you really spoke was so convenient i think you are uh, a master uh, no sir thank you very much i will take it as a compliment but uh, there is lots of things uh, that we can learn I, i i am telling you from my feelings no, no sir absolutely it's spontaneous so i enjoyed the lecture also and uh, um, we will definitely be in touch sir and uh, sure. all thank the participants you. yeah uh, i will share this presentation with sir so that uh, if there is any query uh, my whatsapp number is with sir uh, deepak uh, who will be speaking later on also uh, from somaya college uh, yes, so sir. we need we have to... participants group so we'll i'll share it there yes uh, your presentation sure sir uh, sir, sir there was question i will take i think the last question from mr sanjit darvesh you can unmute because we are Please, 
Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. in time. Yes, sir. Yes. So sir. Let, uh, then I think it will be the last question. Sure, sir. Sanchit can unmute and. Yeah, Mr. Sanchit, Sanchit, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, sir. Hello. Hi, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, actually, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask one thing that, as you said, that we have two types of crust, oceanic crust and uh, continental, continental crust, right? Crust, yes. And uh, continental crust is rich in uh, basically granite and mm -hmm. oceanic crust is rich in basalt. Correct. Right? So I wanted to ask, like, uh, we, we, live, we live on a uh, continental crust, right? Right. Uh, so why is the Kokan region rich in uh, basaltic rock? Yeah, that's a good question, Sanchit. There was another. Uh, uh, there is another type of volcanism on Earth known as continental flood basalts, right? It is known as continental flood basalts, and uh, that comes from hotspot volcanism. Okay, uh, that comes from hotspot volcanism. So basically, when uh, when uh, hot spots come on the ocean, they form ocean islands like uh, Kerguelen or Herds Island, Tristan da Cunha. Okay, so these are all French colonies. Most of them, they are in the middle of the oceans. They are tourist place. Most of them contain volcanism. Uh, uh, so that is uh, that is what. But when continental crust overrides this, when continental crust overrides these. Uh, uh these uh, hot spot okay uh, i am just trying to get a slide immediately that, that i would like to add on to this uh what happens is basically uh, you find another type of volcanism uh, that occurs and that is called as continental flood basalt provinces right so i have the slide i will just add it in one minute and then uh, we can discuss this in person uh, at a later time uh, which is unique to the earth. So, so most of the volcanism on Mars and moon are basically related to that continental, uh, that, uh, that part of the, this thing. So I'm just adding that immediately over here uh, so that I can circulate that uh, to, to my sir and then he can circle. So that is the continental uh, crust here. So you have volcanism on the continents also, like in the case of the Deccan. Can you see that that uh, black spot of the Deccan is connected to the reunion hotspot? So here you can see the hotspot in red dots, and they are volcanism. For example, India is is such a fortunate place where we have uh, volcanism in Silet, uh, in 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 Meghalay, and in Bihar, uh, Rajmal. We have uh, that volcanism related to Kerguelen. And of course, the Deccan and the Konkan itself is related to a reunion close to Seychelles. So I hope I have answered that question to you. And uh, this is another type of unique volcanism. Probably uh, these are the kinds of volcanisms that occur on other planetary surfaces like Mars and Moon. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now it's uh, time to say thanks to uh, Professor Raman, uh, on behalf of uh, the principal and management of, and department of physics of uh, Wilson College, uh, and of course our IAPT, I would like to thank Professor Raman for uh, this lucid and understandable technical kind of uh, presentation and talk. Uh, I personally men show a periodic table in a very different. Uh, meaning because Thank you, uh, usually as a physics uh, student I see only numbers and all that yes, but uh, that was something different which I saw at the same time as a student of uh, materials I could understood now that why spinels are very easy to you know uh, synthesize in garments absolutely sir because uh, uh, many a time when I was working on ferrites uh, yes, sir. It was very difficult to synthesize garnets than spinels. Spinels, exactly. Yeah. So, so if you, 
Yeah. So increase pressure, you will just invert yeah. the spinels to barrel. But uh, it was a little bit difficult task of, uh, you know, temp very high temperature and very high pressure. Sir, we it, have we have diamond anvils at Alabad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is, you can, it is there at uh, BRC also. BRC have, also, exactly. Yeah, yes. they have a high pressure lab at Sir. Yes. But uh, yeah, so it will be a kind of interesting thing now I understood that uh, why this type of phase transformations help us to, as you just mentioned, that then we must marry physics and geology together. Yes. Uh, because during my research also, I was always talking, thinking about geology and all that. So minerals, minerals are minerals. Yes. Sir. So thanks for... Uh, enlightening us for all this and of course we could understand that how volcanoes carry the information about how crushed and poor so thank you very much sir and thank you sir uh, uh, yeah. other questions i think seti sir will have your email address so we will yes. forward it to other participants and they yes. may uh, ask you and they can uh, put you. the questions on the uh, whatsapp group and uh, that can be uh, shared with sir yeah so thank you very much sir Thank and you, sir. Over to uh, Seti, sir. Uh, we'll take over and uh, uh, do another. Uh, uh, means, uh, uh, we'll do. Uh, thank you, thank sir. you, yeah. Thank you, Raymond, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Kapil, I sir. would love to visit Wilson College, one of the best, be beautiful, yes. beautiful buildings in basalt. So I will definitely do that next time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sure, sir. Sure.